Hello statistics students, my name is Jamie Amy and this video is our discussion on, well, we're actually halfway through section 4.3, so uh, this would be video 2 of 2. So if you're looking for the beginning of section 4.3, you're going to want to find the video that was done right before this one. All right, so this video picks up halfway through section 4.3, and it's on finding the probability of this concept or this term at least one. All right, oftentimes we read something, and because we're reading it in the context of statistics and we're learning, maybe a little bit nervous, we forget that we already know a lot of these things. For example, at least one. You guys know what at least one means. So when you read that, I want you to take a step back if you need and remind yourself, I know what at least one means. And this slide um, is just a way that, <laughs> something silly I created to try and help you. So it says, grandma says, I don't want these leftover pies. Take at least one. So let's say grandma has um, two, three, let's say grandma has four leftover pies <clears throat> from Thanksgiving. I added zero there because that is a part of our population. So grandma says to you, I don't want these leftover pies. Take at least one. How many pies can you take that would make grandma happy? What do you think? If you said that you can take at least one of the pies being one pie, two pie, three pies, four pies, or five pie, let's say five was all the pies, so one to three up to all of the pies, then you got it right. So if this is your entire population, zero through five, at least one would mean one, two, three, four, or five. How many pies can you take to make grandma sad? So this is the compliment. Grandma's happy if you take one through five. Grandma's sad if you take none, if you take zero pies. So that would be this right here. So the probability of you taking zero pies plus the probability of you taking at least one pie should add up to one because it's certain to occur. You're certain to take zero, one, two, three, four, or five pies. Okay, I'm going to erase that and show you now how it comes into play for our class. None and at least one are complementary events. That means their probabilities add to one. They can't occur at the same time. Their probabilities sum to one. Um, the probability of no pie taken, so zero pies, plus the probability of at least one pie taken equals one. Now, if we were to take this equation and manipulate it a little bit, so I wanna subtract the probability of no pies taken from both sides of the equal sign. So it's just gonna take this and subtract it from both sides of the equal sign. Then we end up with this right here. Probability of at least one pi being taken, that should be an n, equals one minus the probability of no pi taken. Now we're gonna use the substitution rule. And the substitution we're going to use is no pi taken and all of the pies left with grandma. I need you to think about that for a second. No pie taken and all of the pies left with grandma. Are those the same thing? Yes, if you do not take any pie and you leave or leave all the pies with grandma, those are the same thing. Well, in mathematics, when we have two equal things, we're allowed to substitute one for the other. So that's what we're going to do. And that gives us this result here probability of at least one pi taken equals one minus the probability of, and then we cross this out and we substitute it with all of the pi left with grandma. All right, so what I've done here is show you um, the derivation of this equation right here. This, equa this is the blank template of the equation that you're gonna use whenever you read a question that says, find the probability of at least one. Okay, you'll set up this blank template, find the probability of at least one, and then write here whatever the question says. Then you'll put an equal sign, then one minus, capital P, open parentheses, all, and you'll write the same thing, but you'll switch the last word. And we actually did that up here with the grandma's pies. 
um, we took uh, we took the word let me erase this scrapple scratch work we took the word taken and we switched it with left okay you'll th see so, uh, through some examples that we're going to do right now um, but refer back to this slide if you're questioning why we can use this template uh, to answer our at least one questions okay first example you have 50 DVDs this brand has a 0.5% defective rate. That is, the probability of a disc being defective is 0 0.005. Uh, that came from this, this uh, percentage right here. So one, two, move the decimal twice and you get this 0 0.005 defective rate. And that would mean that the probability of a disc not being defective would be the complement, 0 0.995, okay? So defective rate, not defective rate, those are complements of each other, they add up to one. All right, so we are asked, what is the probability that at least one of your 50 DVDs are defective? And they want accuracy to three decimal places. Okay, so there's that key, at least one, and we're talking complementary probabilities here that we have, at least one of your 50 DVDs. Okay, we're going to take our blank template. Oh, these events are treated as independent, okay? And the reason why is we were given the defective rate, so we're not treating these as, okay, I take one DVD out of the box and then I never replace it um, because we don't have those numbers. We just have the percentage or the defective rate. Okay, so... We set up our blank template, capital P, open parentheses, at least one, and then this wording of your 50 DVDs are defective came straight from the problem. That's the first blank you fill in. Remember, next you put an equal sign, then you put one minus capital P, open parentheses again, and this line, you make it all, and you fill in the exact same thing of your 50 DVDs are, except you switch the last word. So we switched it from defective, which is what the problem said, to not defective. Okay, so that is our setup. What we're gonna do now is translate this from a statement with a lot of English words in it to an algebraic equation. So we'll continue with the equal sign, we'll drop the one, we'll do the minus sign, but now we're going to translate this part here. Okay, probability that at least one of your 50 DVDs are not defective. That would be 50 fractions, if you will. Um, well, actually, we don't have the fractions. We have the decimals. So not defective. Not defective is 0 0.995. So you would... So you would multiply that by itself 50 times. Let me show you. 0 0.995 multiplied by 0 0.995 multiplied by 0 0.995. And you'd have to do this 50 times because we have 50 separate DVDs. Uh, but as we talked about in the last video, we would use exponential notation in this case. And it ends up that we can just do, this is nice. We've done so much work, you guys, but look what it ultimately boils down to. One minus the not defective rate risen to the 50th power. So there's a lot that goes into understanding how we got to that point. But ultimately, the computation is not that bad. It's 1 minus the not defective rate risen to the 50th power. I hope that helps you. And if we calculate that correctly to three decimal places, we get 0 0.222. So that means we have a 0 0.222 probability that, where's the wording here? At least one of our 50 DVDs are defective. So 22% chance at least one of our 50 DVDs is defective. Interesting when you think about it like that. Okay, let's try another one. Um, the reason I want to do this one though, it, it's extremely similar, yet it is different because it does not give us our effective rate or defective rate. It gives us the actual counts. Um, so you'll see here. 
A box of 65 watches contains 11 that are defective and 54 that are not defective. See that? They gave us actual counts and not the defective rates. Okay, if you grab three watches from the box without replacing them, what is the probability that, here's the key, at least one of the three watches you grab is not defective? All right, let's start with our uh, blank template. Now these three events this time are dependent on each other because we're doing without replacement and we have the actual counts. So you're gonna see in our setup that um, like the denominator and the numerator are going to adjust because once we take one watch out of the box, there are less watches in there. That'll change our denominator. And depending on the type of watch we take out of the box, there will be less of that type and so that would affect our numerator. Let me show you. Okay probability of at least one, and then this is the first blank you fill in, of the three watches you pick is not defective. And that came straight from the wording. You don't have to create that on your own. Came right from, let me erase some of this, uh, at least one. It's right here. Of the three watches you grab is not defective. Just copy it into the first blank, okay? All right, next line is one minus the probability that, and we switch it from at least one, we switch it to the word all. We leave everything else the same except for the last word. This time we're going from not defective to defective. All right, now it's time to translate into algebraic symbols, so it'd be one minus, and then we're gonna set up three fractions this time. Only three, not 50, so um, one, two, three fractions. Okay, our first, let me erase that. And that's okay. Okay, our first fraction is, you've got 65 watches in that box. You pull one of them out. What's the probability that you picked out a watch that is defective? Well, there are 11 that are defective. So that would be 11 out of 65 watches. Okay, now that watch is out. You're not putting it back. So when you go back to the box to pull out a second watch, there are only 64 watches left in there and 10 of them are defective, 54 of them are not defective. So probability of you pulling out another defective is 10 out of 64. And you see that adjustment in the numbers? That's because without replacement, this finite set makes our events dependent. All right, that watch is gone. So now we're down to 63 watches in the box, nine of which are defective, 54 are not defective. So the probability of you pulling a watch out that is defective is nine out of 63. All right, I want you to take your calculator out, type that in carefully. I'm gonna erase this scratch work and put it up here nicer for you. There you go. And if you type that in your calculator correctly, go ahead and pause this video and type that in real carefully. Welcome back. If you typed it in carefully and accurately, you would get approximately 0 0.996. So what that means, if we're interpreting those results, imagine you have a box in front of you and has 65 watches in there. You're going to grab three of those watches out. Maybe a customer wants to buy three for some reason. The probability that at least one of those watches you grab is not defective is 0.996. Let me say it a little differently. The probability that at least one of those three watches you grab is not defective is a 99.6% chance. So you're going to have at least one of those three watches be a not defective watch well, with 99.6% chance or 0 0.996 probability. Okay, that will conclude our discussion on section 4.3. My name is Jamie Amy. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time for our discussion on section 4.4.